Dear Andy, thank you very much for making this possible this evening. Yeah. Uh, that you accepted my invitation for this interview. Of course. Well, we first met, I think, in October 2017 during the work on Bernardo Zanotta's uh, Heart of Hunger production. And we did an excellent job. Yeah. Because we, did. we were we are winning prizes. Yes. And we are becoming very popular. That's what I hear. I've never, I've never, uh, I feel like Bernardo. It's a world that I'm not familiar with, the, the art film. I mean, we kind of laugh about this. He's, a, he's quite smart and educated. And um, TV raised me. <laughs> so, he really has a... He has taste, and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever saw the film? Yeah, it was beautiful. Uh, I was mad. I was sad that the accordion scene never made it in because I thought the footage from that wound up look looking stunning. Um, but yeah, he we had dinner the other night for his birthday, and we were talking about the the concluding film to his trilogy, um, which also incorporates the same themes of. Identity, sexuality, homoeroticism, and we will be doing that next year. Yeah, okay. Well, you are a dancer, a teacher, a performer, an entertainer, a singer, a poet, and an MC, which is in hip-hop terms the main rapper. And you are 31 years old <laughs> right now. <laughs> and you started uh, your very interesting life, so far I can see, as a singer in a boys' choir, with even performances in the Carnegie Hall. Can you please tell me where you're from in the United States and how all started for you, somehow? Um, I was born in Portland, Oregon, in the States, in 1987. Um, how it all started, you mean musically? Like how, how from... As a performer and musical uh, dancer? I was a hyperactive kid. Um, I don't know, like, I, don't, I don't remember if my mom put me there because I was singing. I loved things like Star Search and I loved uh, concerts on TV and I remember like, what are they? Those are singers, and I was like, that's their job, wow, where can I do that? Things like this. Um, and then uh, there was a friend of a friend through one of the HR companies my mom was affiliated with that her best friend was starting this children's community choir. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I was, when I was seven or eight, I joined within its conception, and I think I was singing with them all through childhood up until I was 16, so I was probably there for eight years. Uh, and it grew into three choirs for a youth and middle age and then senior pre, pre-professional things. And I, we had been to Carnegie Hall on two different occasions, I think. It's a beautiful space. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, what uh, experienced you at these choirs? I mean, uh, I, I can imagine to perform in, in choirs and then have big performances like in the Carnegie Hall uh, must be overwhelming. Uh, what was your experience too? It was a lot of mayhem because it wasn't just the, the ordeal of a children's choir. Um, it was all of the incredibly involved, um, hysterical stay-at-home moms around this organization that drove it as well like it could not have been done without, without these moms but it also just made everything super compartmentalized and hysterical and um i remember we had to wear matching clothes and polos and like khaki pleated khaki really just dorky um and we had to wear lanyards and um 
I'm sorry, what was the question? Where was I going with this? Like, what? Big performances. Big performances. Oh yeah, big, it was big all audiences. It. Yeah, all the whole the whole village would show up. Um, there was a Christmas. There was like a spring. There was an annual. I remember we even made a small uh, Pinocchio themed operetta that traveled all the way to Montepulciano in Italy for a showing. I was Pinocchio. I was often a soloist. Um, I was one of those boys that could sing high forever. Uh, I was, uh, yeah, from soprano to tenor. Um, it was also very square. I mean, it was uh, based in the suburbs. Um, so it wasn't... I, I remember, like, when I was young, I found it very boring. I did not understand the idea of sitting still and singing. Um, because I was young, and it was just hopeless, because I would just over... I would just respond even worse. Uh, I remember just running around the the rows of singers and the director, singing my part, but just running. Uh, it was really distracting. People hated it, but we couldn't do anything about it. So it's not like I had any, people just kind of let me do my thing. Um, and by the time I was 16, I was, I mean, I could stay seated, but I still felt the same kind of like, why am I always preparing for the next part of my life. That was the thing that I really resented. Like, I'm happy I did it in hindsight. And this is where my mom would give me a big, I told you so. But um, I was a very, like, I was booked as a kid. It was choir, it was extracurricular activities. Then I started dancing and then I started juggling. I was involved in church. And this was a big part of, I guess, maybe it's global, but particularly in the States, it's just sort of the thing. It's, you have to competitively be involved in extracurricular activities because if you don't have an outstanding curriculum vitae by the time you are 18, you're never going to go get into college, so you're never going to get a job, so you're going to be homeless, you're going to die. It's really that kind of um, irrational... Yeah. I wish I... I feel like I missed a bit of, like, um, core, mo like, moments because I was busy preparing to be something I never became anyways because I didn't go to a real school. I went to a conservatory tied to a liberal arts school. Kind of on a fluke. I was scouted. So, um, I remember that. I always struggled with that. Every Tuesday I had to go to choir and every Tuesday I hated going to it. But it was something that I excelled at. Okay. Well, you made it. Uh, you went to the conservatorium in New York. Yes. Uh, you studied, uh, I think, dancing? I did. Um, I went to SUNY Birch's Conservatory of... of the Arts. <laughs> um, and uh, at that point, I had been dancing for most of my high school career, so I had about four years of dance. Um, and I really got into that. I don't know, I was also, I had a little bit of a chubbier, non-athletic body growing up while I was a singer. But then when I was um, 15, my body started to change, and then I decided to... Uh, do something new, and I fell in love with dance. And so I danced, and it was a really aggressive um, pre-professional program, and then I was also doing lessons on top of that with the ballet mistress, who was uh, a huge mentor of mine, but also insane. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, I was a contemporary dancer, but with the concentration in ballet. So I learned a lot of uh, ballet rep from like Kyle Sheen and American Ballet Theater and New York City Ballet. And, um, I loved college. I loved it there. What was the experience? Uh, what did you get there? I partied a lot. Um, I was a really high functioning um,
bipolar kind of person that as long as I could show up to class and lift my legs, I did that well, no one had any questions. And um, between the two of us, my sister had some sort of teen drinking party and things under her belt by the time she graduated, but I was a bit more of like a straight laced kid. Uh, but that all fell apart when I went to college. It was nice to be away from parental supervision in the suburbs. And um, it was what I liked about this conservatory is that it was tied to a real school. So there were students that had like real studies and had realistic plans of like tangible goals. Uh, and it was. Um, this is where I got a lot more cultural conversations, that it wasn't just dancers with dancers talking about dance. Uh, I started to lean into um, thinkers and philosophers and uh, political activists, and uh, it was really enriching because I was already kind of burnt out dancing by the time I even started college, and it took me most of college to realize that I was in fact burnt out. I had also sustained a pretty significant um, injury in my left knee before I even left for school, which left me with half of the, the cartilage in my knee available. So um, it's a lot of sacrifice to dance. It's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. It's, you have to be a bit of a, a sadist. And um, I really enjoyed it, but I think I got a little lost there in college. And you got uh, in touch with hip-hop and rap, right? Actually, I always, was, maybe that was the end, I always, um, yeah, I always loved hip-hop. I think that was actually like my first dance class. There was something so impactful and effective you, you need so much power and musicality uh, and detail. Um, yeah, I was always attracted to that. And also around this time, my musical taste started to change. And I was really touched by hip hop or the cultural narrative um, within it. friends that turn me on to new things and new sounds and shared a competency in it like I could I could make hip-hop dances I could uh, move like a hip-hop dancer uh, I mean but I also went to this I mean this pre-professional program that I was a part of um, in high school was also known for its diversity I mean, to get in, you went through a tap audition, you had a ballet, you had modern, jazz, hip-hop, African, urban, you know, like, that was the, the thing. Um, and I realized, personally, on a soul level, level or, like, a artistic mission, I've always been really interested in Renaissance. I've always come with a few skills, and that's always made me a, a, an asset, I think, in a, in a larger picture of what's happening in a room, what eye are we looking at this with, but it's made forming a career very difficult, particularly in school. Everyone asks you to streamline and pick one and compromise, um, and I never really seemed to be interested in doing so. But I never felt placed, and I never felt belonged, and I never felt appreciated within the, the echelon of academics or what our tasks were. Um, outside, there was always a remark that Andy was great and could do this, 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 and this. But it, it never fit in the form I was operating. So I've been kind of on, I've been, I've constantly sort of gone from skill to skill and uh, now wind up with our, our own collective. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out what to do with that. Yeah. What is the essence of the, the biggest quality? of hip-hop and rap for you. Can you say that? It's, there's just so much life in it. There's so much resilience and passion. 
Um, I mean, if, if you look at it historically, the origins of hip-hop also come from the slave ships. I mean, it was gospels, and gospels became blues, and then blues became jazz, and then jazz, you know, within the Harlem Renaissance is like, black people fought for their own identity within a state that was changing uh, drastically, and uh, many argue that slavery was not that lot, like, it was forever ago, but it was a very short amount of time that a lot of this happened, and, um, I don't know. I... It felt real. Um, the first album that really hit me was The Miseducation of Lauren Hill. And I'm really happy I found that album when I found it because it, one, it was just beautiful. And it just, uh, I was really into some Britney Spears kind of shit up until that point. And then it was really beautiful to hear what soul is as a genre, but also her as an artist and an icon. Um, and she was also an MC and she talked about struggle and, um, yeah, I could never, I think that was one of the most, I listened to that album probably for a whole year on repeat. I don't know why, I just thought it was beautiful. Um, and maybe I saw myself in it and I, I, I don't really know why. Um, because I also have a, I also think hip hop is, is uh, incredibly corporatized and it also can exploit voices and the cultural narrative of most black people living in the States. It's not, it's, it, it grew into something hyper masculine, super aggressive. It's, um, so I don't really associate really anymore. Everything is sort of monetized, but then you're not talking about hip hop anymore. You're talking about industry and how pop culture works. And there's only a few white men at the top getting paid off of all of it anyways, as Kanye West would say. Um, but yeah, I, don't, I, I really liked the ability to, it's something about the accents it's, it's fast, it's quick, it's provocative, it's, it's hypnotic. Mm. And it just takes a, a, an assurance in oneself. And I think I really needed that. Okay. Well, from New York you moved to Rotterdam, what was for sure a big step for you. Uh, and you studied there at the Code Arts. Um, what did you learn there, and uh, can you recommend code arts? Um, I needed it. I needed another year. I'm not going to sit here and bash code arts. I have a big problem with institutions in general, but it's not what it claims to be. Um, there was faculty that couldn't even remember my name the day of graduation or the day of this ceremony where I received this certificate for a year of study and there's a lot of politics and there's a lot of favoritism there's a lot of nepotism there was a lot of drama and a lot of stories about the faculty relations with students um, which would have been absolutely forbidden in the States when it becomes a sexual nature, but all of my professors in the States, I would come to class, uh, on something. And, um, I didn't enjoy my time, but I was also in a larger picture personally. My life was kind of falling apart. Uh, I could not remain an optimistic, um, cooperative student. Um... It's a hard job, I guess, school education, being a teacher, when art is so relative anyways. There's, a, there's an economic demand to create uh, w working professionals, but then you're making working professionals and you're not discussing art and you're not wor uh, teaching people how to freelance and autonomously take care of their own vision. You are crafting bodies that fit institutions and as long as you are outputting professional bodies you are awarded with more funds and infrastructure so it's like uh after the rigmarole of the pre-professional 
world I was in in high school and then the same kind of bullshit for four years at a university in New York to come to Europe crossing my fingers that it was different here to realize that business is business it's all economic um, everyone has a reputation everyone's fighting their own battles it was really disillusioning um, I didn't feel super embraced uh, but I was also a fucking mess so I wouldn't ask anyone from the faculty to do that either so, and, and, and my, my qualms with code arts continue uh, with, with what I'm living now and the institutions I work with and what is real, what is valuable, how can we make change when change is so bound to uh, hierarchy. Um, I'm also, a, 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 you know, my parents were divorced as a kid, so I just don't really have much faith in structures or authority. So I don't know if this is at all... <laughs> valuable or valid, but this is just uh, why I see things the way that I see them. I'm very disappointed by the people who call themselves leaders in my life. Well, you just mentioned it already, uh, somehow you struggled often in your life um, with teachers, uh, maybe the unhealthy lifestyle you were in, uh, with drugs, even trauma problems with people in various uh, ways. Uh, what is your recipe for getting out of that struggle? How did you get out of it? How did you get again somewhere to continue the way you want to go? Oh, I'm still in it. I, I don't know if I'm, I'm out of it. Uh, I just sort of keep revisiting what is and learning to view it in a different way. Um, Things are slowing down a bit, but like it doesn't feel so chaotic in my life. You know, I mean, I'm in therapy. I'm trying to manage myself better. I, I don't blame people for the way that I'm disappointed. Uh, I try and find where I am responsible for my perception of things. But uh, I, I did uh, sustain a considerable amount of trauma when I was a kid. Things that happened in the home. Um, and it just sort of echoed. I mean, I was also, I was a pretty fruity fairy kid and I grew up in the suburbs. Um, I was humiliated daily at school. I was threatened, I was uh, beat up. I was, um, and, and parents gave it their okay to the kids to do this. Um, Teachers that were supposed to be supportive did not have and were not equipped for students like myself. I was one of the only gay kids within an entire, like, decade student body because people just don't come out in that town. Um, or it's not true, like, I took a step and people took steps, but, um, yeah, you know, and when you when you grow up in that environment, you, you, your brain responds in a certain mechanism that is often destructive. Um, I was raised to believe that no matter what I strived for, uh, my higher self, my highest self, no matter how much of my potential I dreamt of fulfilling, um, the expectations I was given was just to amount to illicit drug abuse and promiscuity and I was going to get AIDS and I was a faggot and language from before I was an even sexual being <laughs> when I was a child, adults were already putting this information into me. And so that has been a huge part of my life for most of my life is fighting this darkness. Um, so I now see a therapist. I did go through a period of hallucinogenics and the self-proclaimed research of uh, shamanism, ayahuasca, its tribal origins. I think that was also really helpful. That really unlocked a few things and really showed me that, uh, yeah, it's also so much, life is so much bigger than my suffering and I could dream again and um, but it's been hard. I'm uh, kind of a, a lonely person. 
I am just beginning to recognize my skill set and what I want to do with it, which gives me hope. But um, it's hard. It's just the way my brain is. Okay, thank you for being that open with me here. I think it's important to be. Yeah. Well, you did uh, auditions for Club Guy and Ronnie then. After a while. I did not. I did not oh, audition no. ever. Um, <laughs> One exception. Um, no, they were making a piece with the Poetic Disasters, with a group of stagiaires that had auditioned, uh, between Hendrik Arts and uh, Angela Haranda. And I was a close friend of Angie's from her Rotterdam days, because actually we were in the same class when I was here at, at Code Arts. So we went way back, and actually her um, ex-husband produced my first demo tape. So Angie's a bit of a reoccurring angel figure in the story of my life, that she kind of picks me up and drops me off in the places that I need to be. And uh, she did it again after the years of uh, rap albums and emceeing. Um, she was making this piece with Hendrick. Hendrick was interested from what he saw on, of all the footage. He saw my work as a rapper, as an MC, and some of the, the um, promotional profiles. So we got to hear a bit about what I thought and why I did what I did. So we had a series of interviews. And then he asked that I perform with the cast of Casper and the Poetic Disasters for that year's pro, uh, Parada tour. And um, yeah, the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> but did you feel comfortable in the Poetic uh, Disasters Club? Yeah. Uh, what was your experience? Yeah, I, I really needed a place like this. Um, I met other people with childhoods similar to mine, with outlooks like mine. Wanting to change and not fully understanding how. Um, Hendrick's work and the theme of Casper was super poignant. Uh, and it felt like one of the first times that I was really using all of my skills in text as an actor, as a musician, as a former dancer. Um, I saw what I could do. And then the mentorship was really great. That's also what I really like about um, Guy and Roni is that There are, I've met so many directors that have decided that what they see is truth in their art and they lord it over everyone. My art, my truth, or the truth. Forgetting the simple fact that all, life, all fucking uh, opinions are relative. And that's what I really liked about Guy and Roni. They had a skill set, they had a vision, they wanted to create things that they believed in, that they themselves could produce, and then they found their way through hard, hard work. Um, also a bit of bluffing. You know, you have to shake the right hands, you have to believe in your value, you have to believe that you are worth it. And that was what I needed to hear. I didn't need to hear one more time that I need to point my feet like this for me to get to the next part of my life. I needed to believe in myself um, and I needed to get organized and I needed to assemble. And that's also what I found really invigorating and inspiring with the cast is that it was a group of terrible millennials, uh, but they were all able to assemble you know, in the right moment, put their shit aside and put something more important together. And that was great, because if we couldn't, because we're terrible, we're, we're terrible, we're narcissists, we're, we're so addicted to our suffering, and it's not easy, we're not easy people to work with, I'm sure, but um, if we couldn't do it, how can we expect the right and left to, or the east and west, you know, like microcosm um, and I just enjoyed them I enjoyed them so f fucking much so are you a child of club guy and Ronnie? a bit I'm a big I'm a big fan uh, I mean also like I do a lot of work with the educational department at MNT um, 
Guy and Roni have really helped assist me in a way to recognize kind of what my skills are and have created opportunities for me to step into those if I so choose. Uh, I'm really I'm, uh, super grateful for that. But I'm also Andy as I can be. What, is, what does that mean? Well, it's funny, like, um, I don't fit. It's not that I've ever had a, a job with the club. Uh, I had one role in a project for the Poetic Disasters. We've talked about it, but uh, I'm a bit unique. I don't fit an ensemble. Uh, that's why I never did Corps de Ballet, and that's probably why I'm not a paid actor with the Nord Nederlands Toenail. Um, and I don't think my career is as an employee of someone else's vision. I think the, the, my personality type will only thrive if I'm able to produce my own work because I, I don't think many people see things the way that I do and I need to stop expecting people to and just do it myself with the people that think with me, like me, um, towards something. Okay, well, well, you did that. You started together with Agnes, Milan and uh, Manu, yeah. Teddy's Last Ride. Yeah which also has a subtitle. It's like Adventures from Groningen. <laughs> Explain the name, please, and what are the adventures from Groningen so far? <laughs> um, Teddy's Last Ride was the name of the first piece we made on our own. Okay, let me rewind. So. Typically, the Stagia program runs for only one year, the Poetic Disasters. Within the first year, we had a quite a successful year, and then the club became, or moved to the Machina Fabrique and out of the, the church on the Akkerstraat. And there was buzz that there were funds or an interest or an unspoken dream of Guy that one year the Poetic Disasters would try and actually run as like a, a, that, a collective of their own, that the Poetic Disasters club stagiaire program could in fact be more like a talent development situation so we uh, got some proposals together and asked that we run again for a second year as the poetic disasters and in this year we did another piece with hendrik and tanya um, made a piece on us called teddy's last ride and i guess there was a bit of the um, the, the apex of what we are becoming in it, or the, the seed. Teddy's. Who is Teddy? From Tanya's perspective and from the origin of this first piece, Teddy's Last Ride, uh, Tanya was really interested in, um, yeah, this, this sort of London subculture punk scene from the 80s. They were known as Teddy's. The outcasts, the misfits, uh, the, the latchkey kids, um, low class drug users, rebel rousers. Um, and for some reason we really identified with that. I mean, there was a lot of partying in the first year as well. A lot of celebration. I don't know why. I've partied a lot in my life, but I liked partying with them the most. Everyone seemed to be really on the same kind of mission. It wasn't just about fucking yourself up or uh, hooking up. It wasn't just about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It was really about a trip and talking to strangers and laughing and curiosity and whimsy. And I never met people, a whole crew of people that liked to do, to do that. And um, so we were really connected to this thing. And we put it in a wider picture of uh, millennials, why are we all doing this, why are we so fucked up, that we sort of exist in this, we're too old to be young and we're too young to be old, so what the fuck are we going to do? Um, yeah, there's a bit of chaos to it and a bit of anarchy, but it's also, um, I think, something really important. Well, yeah, thank you. Um... What do you like about your fellow main colleagues? Like uh, we have Agnes, Milan and Manu. What are their qualities for you?
they make me a better person. Um, Agnesa has a, a drive and a fire that I lost. Uh, Milan, um, no one feels alone when Milan's in the room. And, uh, yeah, Manu has sort of become my, my family. We lived together in Haddon, like in the same building. And, um, he's taught me so much about friendship. And I really, uh, having spent so much time on my own in my formative years prior to becoming a Teddy, that has needed a lot of work. Um, when we go back to what I was talking about, mental health, the, I need to, it's hard for me to connect. It's hard for me to see myself in others, but I have to if I'm going to survive. And I think Manu has been one of the most key component, components to this. This is why I love them all. Nice. Well, your first production was uh, Through the Wally. Yeah. Or Wally. Uh, and now you are working on The Others. Yeah. And you had a, a New Year's Eve uh, kind of uh, performance at the Paradigm. Yeah. Here in Groningen. Uh, can you try to tell at least what the essence is of your production so far, the new one. Um, yeah, I'm building a bit of a spectacle. Uh, I've been working as a musician and a vocalist for the Teddies or for Manu's pieces or Hendrix. Um, but I really wanted to put something forward for my own skill set. Uh, and it's the others. Um, It's a collection of five uh, electronic pop singles I've been working on for years that are now in the process of being mixed and mastered and brought to their fullest potential. And it's about my own alienation. It's a bit of a loneliness. Um, talking about the, the misfit that I am. Uh, where that sends me in myself and where it places me in the world. And, um, but at the same time, it's not a, it's not a, I'm not trying to make art. I think I want to make something a bit more accessible that fits in electronic venues. That can be a bit dark and, um, industrial at times, um, I've been in these dirty basements for quite some time and there's a lot to be found in the shadows and your own trip. Uh, I think that's why places like Paradigm are very important, but there's a lot of lost souls too. So I just wanted to make something sweet and nice and spectacular to kind of be a bit of a light in a dark place. And um, we're just building an hour-long show that is in co-production with Paradigm and we'll tour and welcome to the village in Nuovarda, Paradigm, and also play at Simplon, um, Clash. But I'm also hoping to create, uh, develop it into a longer four-year plan that also becomes a published electronic pop album as well as a published illustrative comic. Um, that I finally can, I see I'm finally kind of trying to assemble all of these skills and this story that is, exists in me and how I want to tell it while also creating kind of, um, a brand for the teddies. And is there a general message you want to spread with this work? Or do you come more close to something like that? I don't know. That's kind of the, the struggle. It's also a bit of my insecurity. How much content w is going to come across? How much content is there? How much content can you really get to through pop, through spectacle? Um, do I want it to be sad? and Do I want it to be entertaining? How do we create this contrast of depth? in a work, uh, but it's not a theater piece. So I have to figure that out. Um, the, the whole arc of uh, a published album and an illustration, 
that's also way more exciting. Um, the parallel realities, the, 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 the myths of the friends and colleagues I work with. Um, I like to exaggerate. I like everyone to know uh, that I see them as superheroes. But uh, there's no budget for a major motion film picture about superheroes just yet. And uh, I also think that's sort of a tacky story to make a live musical show. So I would prefer to do it where I think it could really flourish, which is in illustrations. So this one project has a bit of an arc. I'm not sure really much more than that. I know why I'm doing it. <laughs> okay. Well, can, can you tell me, uh, just also in general, but of course for you, what do you need in a piece? What, what is your opinion about what is dance theatre today? What is the quality today in 2019? What do you need and what do you want uh, from your work? Um, this may be a little disappointing or underwhelming. You know, I've been screaming my truth from the rooftops for years. Uh, I see a possible future and I think with my art I have the capacity to help myself and others take a step towards this, but that's also a bit idealistic. And it's also relative. Um, I don't have much to say about art. I have opinions, I have tastes, I like things, I don't like things. Um, I think a lot of, I think it's unfortunate that artists <laughs> are paid so little that it's such a struggle to work as an artist that so much of their institutions and the things around art and content have the, the, the money, the, I don't know. I, for the first time, I'm not really interested in trying to convince anyone that <laughs> something's beautiful, this is real, this is important. Um, I think that's where art to me is a ritual. I think the origin of art in our human history was shamanic. That there was few people in a tribe that understood abstraction and used art to abstract and communicate with the villagers because life is hard to figure out, to cathart together in the village. I think that was the origin. I'm trying to see how that works to my own. Um, so it's a ritual that this is less about the message. It's just my story done in a fantastic way. If you're interested in my story, you'll like my story. If not, there's other things to click on. Um, this shows for me and the Teddies to create infrastructure and uh, a fundament and a safe place. Okay. Well, as a performer, you have many identities, right? Uh, you change clothes, you change makeup, outfit and infit, if I can say it like that. Uh, <laughs> how do you feel within all these huge changes? And which identity are you dreaming about? I we talked a little bit about it last time. In some ways, it fits me like a glove. It's a bit of my nature. I'm a bit of a, a shapeshifter. Um, it's also a defense mechanism. It's also a survival tactic. I have to change to survive. Uh, or I've had to. Sometimes I like it, sometimes I don't. Um, I understand the role that I'm playing in Through the Valley, but sometimes I don't understand why I have to be the one to tell it. Um, why does it need a red dress and a whole other identity when it's just my story anyways? 
what I, I you know I, this, this is also a thing like I used to really be into drag and fashion and you know when I was this New York dancer. I had the New York dancer persona and I had all these outfits and it was super important and The older I got the more I realized it put me at a distance from most of the world If that makes sense I mean you would have maybe worn that scarf because it had a certain and it made it was a you know, beautiful, but the other person across the street thinks you're gay, or you're uh, too much, or you're a snob, or clothes is clothes. Um, I think we, 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 we take way too much focus on clothes. It's also why I like to show them I'm this one minute, I'm this that minute. I'm still the same person. I just realized that, um, yeah, I got lost in costumes too. I think it's easy to get lost in the costumes you wear. So, although professionally I am, I often play the devil or the vixen or the provocateur and through the works that I've done, I change appearances. Uh, I just wear jeans and sweatshirts now. Can you tell me how you memorize your work, the steps, the lyrics, your work? How do you structure, how is the structure in, in, in movements look like? Um, you mean like dancing? Yes. I mean, I don't really dance like I used to. It's very sweet that you still call me a dancer. I'm hardly a dancer. Um, practice, patience routine uh, when I'm writing my own work and making my own music it's quite natural because I get in this rhythm of just sort of looping and re repetition when I was working with um, Hendrik it was a lot of text from Peter Handke um, you just have to make yourself hungry for it and you have to sit down and you have to find the rhythm and actually, if you just do kind of 30 minutes a day well in advance, you're actually quite prepared, and I like to be prepared. And I like the Hanka text, too, because you really start to see the game he's playing with language. Like, you can really start to kind of get into the brain of whoever wrote whatever you're reading with that amount of attention, patterns, and structures in their own voice. Okay. And did you also practice somehow stillness and movement like shapes of stillness do you experience something like that sometimes in your work maybe during your rehearsals physically like uh well we were we, we we've been researching buto a bit this year yeah it's super transformative um it's not as easy as it looks it is Quite still. Uh, yeah, we, we, we really um, try a bunch of things. What do you like about it? Do you like it? I just like that it's, a, it's again, that's another... I really hate things that become technique. Uh, and there is a technique to Bhutto, depending on which teacher you get. Again, it's all relative. Um, each teacher comes with its own kind of trick or focus. Uh, but it's, again, another way of um, storytelling. It's ghostly. A lot of the activities are quite... Um, you have to visualize. And the, 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 these visualizations, I think, are important because... Um, some of them are walk forward with the support of your ancestors. <laughs> I think it's important to try and feel that sometimes. Um, again, and, and then the origins of Bhutto, uh, why it carried such a, a creative connection to our work is that having done Through the Valley and having talked about light and dark so much with Hendrik and our work with him and as we turn our heads towards uh, Manu's new creation to the moon and back working title 
Um, he, in part of his research, it stated that like the East and the West of the world, the West is light and the East would be shadow. Not one is good or bad, but like um, in the West, everyone wants to arrive at a conclusion. Everyone wants to put a form and an answer and a shape on everything to know what it is. This is that, that is that, done where the Eastern traditions uh, are okay with a bit of mystery and the unknowing and the unfulfilled. Um, I think the West could really use some of that right now, just like, this is, this is what it is. Life is weird, it's fucking absurd. We don't know if it's that, um, but it's also good to push and research and investigate. Uh, so that is why we do Puto and that is why I love it. Great. Well, you are also teaching. Um... Why are you teaching and what are you teaching and uh, why you like it uh, and who are your students? Please share maybe one or two stories. Uh, I'm teaching because I need, need the work. Um, that's always kind of why I teach in these sort of slower periods. But considering I've been so rooted in learning, I've been able to kind of build a bit more of a reputation or an affiliation with the, the Nord Nederlands Tonale and some of their, their outreach. Um, generally, I am teaching hip-hop. I am generally using the form of a hip-hop class for non-dancers. Students from local junior highs or high schools, um, sometimes marketeers or on the professional side of things, that they're at the NNT all day in meetings, so they need a, something a bit active, led by someone within the whole clique that also correlates to the themes of the piece. Um, and... Yeah, basically non-dancers. I, I, I use dance for non-dancers. And why? Um, dance is incredibly cathartic and natural and healthy and everyone's afraid to do it <laughs> because we live in a world where oh you're a dancer i don't dance i'm not a dancer i go i have a nine to five job you know that we we sort of you weren't given a body to think your way through life and and sit down and and never see how you can move because it's amazing You live in this body your whole life, but you barely know what it does. Habits, tics, uh, from the way you hold your, your posture. It says so much about your personality, but we don't realize this. So if I, find, I find it really fascinating. And so a group of strangers, non-dancers come in, um, probably scared, uh, insecure, or convinced that they're not a dancer. And then I um, do a bit of shitty stand-up comedy where I self-deprecate, I throw myself under the bus, I let them know that they are way cooler and way more great than me. I'm just a silly clown. And when people feel safe, <laughs> they do amazing things. So I try and create spaces in which people feel safe to try new things. And I use hip-hop because it is the most kind of accessible form that people recognized because of pop culture and how hip-hop is exploited. Um, <laughs> so you get people to um, try new things, present themselves with the confidence they didn't know that they have, give them easy tasks so they leave feeling like they succeeded, as opposed to, oh, I didn't get that step right, I'm never going to make a good dancer. I'm not, and, and I remind them often that like, I know none, none of you danced before and you might not dance again after this, but if you're gonna do anything in life, you're gonna need to try new things and things outside of your comfort zone. So if that's all you want to work on in an hour, great. And it, it works. It's nice. Do you have a story you want to share? Yeah, I was, I was like, uh, Because I, 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 uh, I don't always feel like I'm the one who should teach because I didn't uh, study teaching. I wasn't anticipating to be a teacher. It's still a kind of a part-time thing. 
Um, but I, it's important also for me to see myself as a leader. Uh, I often, because of the things that we've talked about, will implode or feel like I have nothing to offer. And in these environments, I see that I can bring out gold shiny pieces. Um, but it was kind of validated in my work with the NNT. There was a, a lot of schools from like Winskolte. And one kid was incredibly hyperactive. There was no way that I was going to get him to move with a group. Um, but I also knew that it was going to be so disastrous if I also alienated him for it. Clearly this kid works at a certain frequency that none of us are going to be able to do anything about. Uh, I was just very flattered that he did his best to stay with the group. And it was a bit distracting at first, but then he started to kind of meander and move around. And I was like, hey buddy, like, I just want to let you know that I really appreciate, appreciate you staying, staying here with us. Like, you don't have to do the steps. You, you, uh, you clearly want to move like this. I get that. I don't know. I just sort of let him be, but we made a compromise that I was just like, you can just sort of stay with us, not around the room. Cause then it makes me feel like you really appreciate me and here I am appreciating you. And we got, I don't know. And then that whole response just landed. He almost seemed surprised that I was talking to him like that. And uh, it was really confirming because afterwards his teacher that had been his homeroom teacher for several years was just like, I've never been able to break into that kid. He really taught me something today. Um, and this is where I think what I'm onto is, a, uh, is a important because it's not a right or wrong or a technical application developed or learned in a school for teaching certification. It's just a genuine response to a kid with incredibly hyperactive uh, impulses. That was nice. That's very special. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, if you think about a melody now, can you just whisper or hum this melody for me? Any melody. Any. Anything is good. Music soul child. Great. Just a friend. What is your idea of beauty? What is beautiful for you? <laughs> Kindness. Mm. Honesty. Mm. Sadness. Wait. And who are you when there is no act? action around when you can relax do we have uh, crazy uh, hobbies maybe who are you in private i don't like myself when no one's watching often I don't think I know yet how to relax with myself yet. When I'm with myself, I don't feel relaxed. Um, I try to create structures and creative uh, things. So I produce music. I use Ableton and these softwares as kind of like my own diary or journal, turning my own little melancholy into pop songs. Because if I just write down how I feel, it's just so fucking cliche. <laughs> um, and I really like to illustrate. 
Um, but these things often sort of trigger kind of like maybe uh, something on the spectrum of autism because uh, once I start drawing, I can't really stop until it's finished. And my illustrations are often hypergraphic detailed um, works that take a few days to finish and I, I will sometimes forget to eat and these kinds of things. Like they're a bit manic. Um, but yeah, I don't know if everyone else is like this, but I'm, I'm kind of a, a mess on my own. <laughs> well, thank you very much for this beautiful talk. I Thanks for having me. Very good luck for all your projects and everything that will come and reach you. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Is that okay? Absolutely. <sighs> oh my god. I'm happy. Thank you. I'm happy you're happy. I Thank like you very to, much. Uh, yeah, really. I like to waste people's yeah. time. So now you can smoke. Yeah, I was like, you started to fidget there towards the end of it, right? I was just sort of like. I really hope that you will not stop in the middle of uh, something and just go out to smoke. I really thought, oh my god, what can I do? Oh, I would never. <laughs> Considering what a terrible addict I am with all of my vices, I have a very strict professional code. Like, I don't show up to work stoned. I could never smoke. I, uh, if you need me in a meeting, I'm going to be there. Cigarettes are later. I wouldn't want to. Oh, <laughs> well, you're welcome. Maybe it's just a close bond. And then we can work together. Oh, that's yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Good. So I'm going to go roll a cigarette. <laughs> 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 Terrified. Well, wait.